Uh, vlog, want to get right into the rant. Uh, maybe it's because I like Iris more than Babin. I gave him <laughs> nothing yesterday. Uh, by the way, this brewing like controversy of the different filmers and producers, oh my, my this battle is very <laughs> exciting for me. Yesterday, I went to a Knicks game. I wore an ugly sweater, natty light sweater because I knew I had courtside seats and I knew that the sweater would stand out. Just moments ago, I was on Sports Center. They were showing a ridiculous highlight that serendipitously happened near me. And then I, you know, celebrate. I'm sure we're chopping it in right now. With his accuracy when it's a fast. What a finish from Tim Hardaway Jr. That's like one of those jerk dude perfect videos. The dance? Yeah. I don't know. The, the, the sweater. Is that a Maddie Light sweater? Yes, it is. Oh my God. And they made a reference to me, which then got a lot of people who follow me to mention me on social. I engaged with them. This, my friends, is what's called classic attention arbitrage, right? Understanding what you need to do, not only digitally or by being in the community 90 times, two cents at a time, but also understanding in real life, you know, whether it's your speaking style. And it's not about being provocative or ridiculous for the sake of being ridiculous. You need to be authentic to yourself, right? And so it's not a mohawk or a big hat. It's like, I can wear some sweaters. I can do that. I'm comfortable with that. So it's not forcing it because lack of authenticity is the vulnerability at the macro of this whole game but it's also understanding the nuances, how it actually works, what the world really trades on, what breaks out. And I think we see a lot of bad versions of people hacking attention, playing to the worst of our traits, and we've seen that historically in many different ways, in culture, in politics, in government, in business, in a million different ways, but there's a fun way to do it. Wearing an ugly sweater courtside at Madison Square Garden is a fun way to do it, it's a subtle way to do it, and it's an intriguing way to do it, and there's a lot of micro ways to do it as well. So be thoughtful of not only your online hacking of attention and the execution of the creative, but also offline. Also, when you're at conferences, like so many of you are gonna waste so much money on buying a booth at a trade show in 2018, at least do something interesting about it. Not giving away a free stress ball tchotchke or a charger with your logo on it. Rick. Sorry, I wasn't sure. Gary, I'd like you to introduce you to David Bassett, who's the head of our business. David, David, such a pleasure. Thank nice you so much you. for having me. No, thanks for joining us. Yeah, I'm really excited about Heard it. Heard a lot about you. I'm sorry we weren't able to talk in the. In no worries. The meeting, no worries. I've, I've got what I needed. Today. I've got a, all I truly need is to reverse engineer what the audience needs. Okay. And so I have enough context at this point between the B2B and B2C behavior and the regionality. And Actually, I didn't get that. The, they're from all over Europe. You at, where, where are the companies from? Predominantly North America. Okay. Uh, we do have a few guests from Right, got Europe it. But sort of it's this predominantly, predominantly North America. And, and North America means 90% US. A little Canada. A little bit of Canada, smaller, little. And Mexico. what would be your guess at B2B versus B2C by percentage of the audience? 75% B2B. Yeah, and their B's, when their B that they're connecting to, food services? Yes, yeah, so it'd be retail distribution and, and that sort of thing. So we, we stand everything from the, the growers to the processors to the logistics to the, distributors. to the distributors to the retailers. I understand. So it's probably a pretty even spread, spread across those five or, I understand. or so uh, segments. Fantastic. But they're all really excited about hearing about the, the full chain. Yes. Uh, we always talk, uh, our mantra has always been farm to, to table fork. or fork. And now we're going to say, actually now it's fork driving farm to a large degree as well. So that's consumer that's centric. The that's the theme today. Consumer centric. You know, one of the things that really works for me and getting a little behind the scenes here, again, Iris, this is strictly because I like you so much more than Babin, so I'm giving you so much here. I mean, this, the vlog's already done. I mean, we're done here. I mean, you're done. I mean, you're, you're, you know, we call it a day. Um, If you notice this, I don't really prep for, I talk a lot about improv, I don't prep. It's very simple. I work backwards. Uh, Most people think about their business and then figure out the customer. I think about the customer and then figure out the business. I already understand what's happening in the customer in a B2B and B2C environment. That's what I spend 100% of my time on. And so then when I come here, because of my history of 25 years of understanding business and really intuitive kind of entrepreneurial gifts that I was handed uh, in DNA wise, it came natural to me, you know, that's it, that's it. What was this, three minutes of talk between two people? Like, I'm gonna go slay 
completely go savage on these people's faces, one of the best talks they'll ever see, and it wasn't 40 years of, you know, it wasn't 40, it wasn't four to 10 hours of, of research, it wasn't making a deck for six hours, editing it in here right now, it's because I bet on my strengths. I know what's going on with the consumer, which is, makes me disproportionately more powerful always. The end. Whoever is closest to the consumer, Amazon, me with the way I community manage, read, spend all my time consuming that, right? Also deploying empathy, not being short term, so I'm not asking for as much. I'm so pro-consumer, you. I'm so pro-you that that gives me the understanding and the leverage and then I just deploy because everything else is the same shit. Like this and this and as big as this is, right? And this, right? It's all the same at the end. Gotta reverse engineer and bring value. Hey. So while you're speaking, all three screens that we have will be on iMag. Yep. And then during Q and A, we'll put up your agency slide that we received. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there any way that you can put that up in the uh, the agency slide in the first like two three minutes for the people that may want to tweet along at home or anything like that? I know the demo, the audience, but still just to give them some context. Sure. Like maybe sure. the first two minutes and then switch. Okay. And then end with. Okay. Sounds awesome. Good. We can do that. By the way in my continuation here, this is all for Iris. Um, if you noticed, I don't know if Iris caught it, I asked for them to, sh- they said we're gonna show you live in the last 20 minutes we'll show your slide. My slide has my information, my, my URLs, my YouTube channel, my Facebook. I asked for the first two or three minutes for it to be shown and then do what they want. Why did I do that? Because it's the same game, attention arbitrage. If only three people in that room, and that's supposed to be a conservative baby boomer audience, so I'm looking at three of the 300. If three of them look up, see my Twitter handle, follow me, and start tweeting along the way, even to 27 followers, right? One person from that one person may follow me or be intrigued by something that person that's tweeting along while I speak quotes during my talk. That is why subtly, something that wouldn't normally be edited into this vlog, in a world where I'm trying to show you more of my subtle nature, my nuances, that dollar eighty strategy. I'm trying to challenge myself, especially when I love the person behind the camera. So if DRock was here or Bab and Kyle, no I would not. But for Iris, I'm gonna push it out here and make a much better vlog, make the best vlog ever. This is gonna be the best episode ever. You know, that's why I asked for it. That little subtle thing of asking for the first two minutes to have the slide will lead to one potential person tweeting my quotes along my talk to 27 followers, which one person may actually find interesting, which will create them to follow. One. The acquisition of one. It matters. No matter how many people you have following you. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Gary Vaynerchuk. Thank you. Morning. Um, very, very happy to be here. Uh, really enjoyed the opening monologue. Uh, in in the context of today's morning, I uh, tweeted just now. It's been interesting over the last 72 hours, whether in a Wall Street Journal interview or a business meeting, now a conference and a lot of uh, one-on-one meetings. I've heard the same thing about 11 or 12 times, and it struck me finally this last time on stage, which is how many people keep saying the word or the sentence, it's changing, it's changing. I think anybody here this morning that hasn't fully quantified how much has actually changed. This has changed. I I think there is an unbelievable disconnect between the framework and strategy of how we are running our businesses, whether a B2B or B2C environment, on us calibrating, is it changing or has it changed? And more importantly, the practicality of the timing. I spend very little time on the impact of self-driving cars in a micro, in a 24 or 36 month window, but I try to understand and quantify them in a macro. I'm not in the luck business, I'm in the marathon running business, and more importantly, I'm in the timing business. I'm so deeply actually consumer centric that I don't have any other gear. The only thing I ever do is try to reverse engineer the attention of my end consumer, whether in a B2C or a B2B environment, and I try to understand things like, it, it blows my mind how many people here feel comfortable because they have long term contracts and relationships with some of the biggest companies in the world without realizing that those companies themselves are so disproportionately vulnerable 
And, and I just, I, you know, I, I play with this, right? I play with the fact that $80 billion is spent on television commercials on the Fortune 500 CPG brand side, yet 94% of them lost market share because not a human being on earth watches a television commercial. Literally nothing we talk about, or way more importantly, literally nothing that controls the attention of our end consumer existed 13 years ago. We need to take a big step back in this room and understand what we are talking about is not social media or Snapchat. What we are talking about is the maturity of the internet itself, what that means to the human race, and everybody in this room, including me, is so disproportionately misunderstanding how substantial this shift is and what happens over the course of the next decade. The internet is the middleman, period. It was some guy or gal that owned 13 medallions in taxis in this city, second or third. It is the hotel rooms and the supply and demand of that world turn today. It is the media companies across the board's turn right now, and it may be your business next. Walmart's not gonna give you the contract. Walmart's gonna have to do it itself. They're gonna, be, they're gonna buy dairy farms. They're gonna grow the grain. Everything gets shrunk. And so we have to take a real step back and understand that there is only one thing, one, there's one thing that will keep you from being a commodity, your brand. The only thing that will keep you away from being completely commoditized is your brand. Can you create an environment where somebody actually makes an emotional decision or a subconscious decision, not a practical one? Because if you're in the middle, and people are gonna make practical decisions, there's an enormous amount of vulnerability in the system. And so look, this is real disruption. This isn't ha ha. This is over the course of the next decade, 90, 80, 70% of the biggest companies in multiple sectors will not only decline, but completely diminish and completely vanish. That is minor leagues compared to the fundamental human shifts we're going through. Did anybody see the robot that went viral on the internet the other day? This like robot that was doing like twists and turns. How many people, just raise your hands, I'm curious. Did you see what Elon Musk said about it? Which was, so there's this robot, you have to find this, I don't have a lot of data on this, you know, it's in the feed, you know, in the headline reading society, I don't like to talk about things I don't know. Here's what I know. A robot that scared the crap out of me was in my feed, right? just doing stuff that makes LeBron look like me, right? (laughs) Elon Musk decides to take that, somebody more educated in robotics than I am, and said something very clever, and I know enough about how he communicates, where he's like, you think this is cute? In 24 or 36, I don't remember the timing. Very shortly, you won't even be able to see this robot without technology, that it will be so fast that the human eye can't even see it. Everybody in this room needs to realize that we are about to run an incredibly fascinating business marathon and most of you aren't even on the treadmill yet. And let me explain. The treadmill to me is how you spend your money on marketing and sales. Thank you. Thank you. The only way you're gonna win this is to run a marathon when it feels like you need to run a sprint. So first and foremost, there's no right way. You don't look at me and that's the right way to do it. There's only one right way. What's right for you as an actual human being. So first and foremost, personal brand, a lot of people try to fix things and make people what they're not versus going all in on what they are. You have to go all in on who you are. Uh, I I don't even know what else to tell you. Like this is uh, the framework, I call it a blueprint, Uh, you call it a principle, it's the punchline. It's short term, long term, it's the value of patience, it's micro failures, macro wins, it's just all the same shit. One of the things that's interesting is I live much more in in principles. To me things are very macro. There's there's rules about patience and the long game and humility, self-awareness, lack of romance. I'm just not romantic about anything that happened yesterday. Things of that nature. Well what that does is it gets very theoretical. 
and I'm concerned that my audience is getting the framework, but they are so hungry for the details, back to schooling and things of that nature. And I always say, leave that to others. But once in a while I get inspired. So, so I said, look, there's nine, trend, there's nine posts per hashtag. Every day I want you to pick 20 hashtags that are relevant to your business or your ambitions, your nonprofit, whatever it may be, right? So nine times two cents for every post. Go to those posts, look at the post, consume the post, and add value to the conversation. You end up leaving a dollar eighty a day of your two cents times ninety. Ooh, cool. It is very practical. Right. And and that is very rare for me because I I'm just not into that. It's not how I process. Uh, okay, but you you see you know those things. Do it in your do it in your own way. You can just knock these things off like this. You'll love this, right? Okay. I apologize. This is insane that this is happening. Iris, this is how you have to edit the day. Today, Iris came to me, she films me all day today. I'm at a conference, I'm making a joke that I like her the best more than D-Rock and Bab and the other people that film me. And I said, because of that, I'm gonna start articulating. And this is maybe in the subconscious. I didn't even know we were doing the Q&A show today. Theoretically, I knew it was coming this week, but it could have been tomorrow. I literally started explaining things. They came to me and they said, we're gonna put up your slide at the end of your talk. I said, can you put up the slide for the first two minutes when I go up there and then you can show me live on the, jump, on the three different screens and then you can end with my slide. Is there any way that you can put that up in the, uh, the agency slide in the first like two, three minutes? That's just my normal demeanor. But what I did was I challenged myself, back to what you just asked me to do, and I looked in the camera and I explained to my audience in real time why I did that. I asked for the first two or three minutes for it to be shown and then do what they want. Why did I do that? Because it's the same game, attention arbitrage. And it's because the way Twitter works if there was even one person in that audience that would see the slide go up, follow me on Twitter, or get to know what my handle was, and they wanted to tweet my quotes while I was speaking, that wouldn't have been able to be done had the slides come at the end, and that's why I always ask for my slide to go up in the first two minutes with my social media handles so that the audience can become the amplification of awareness of what I have to say. And so I'm starting to get into a process in this point of my career where I am starting to challenge myself to get into these details, and I assume that makes a lot of sense well, to you because that's yeah, what you yeah. do.